Hello and good afternoon friends. Welcome once again to the CEC Edisit live lecture. Dear friends, uh, as you know that in our uh, previous lectures, uh, we talked about uh, mineral nutrition in plants. Uh, dear friends, today also we would be discussing on this very topic uh, and uh, we'll try to understand and uh, grab more of the uh, inputs, more of the knowledge uh, from uh, Dr. Ashish Nandi who is um, already uh, uh, with us in our studios. Dr. Nandi is a professor in School of Life Sciences. Uh, from uh, JNU. So, first of all, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Ashish Nandi. And uh, dear friends, as I have already told you that uh, we have already conducted one session on this particular topic that is mineral nutrition in plants. So, we would be starting from the point where we left in our previous session and uh, would be learning more through him. So, Dr. Nandi, welcome once again to the CCA Reset Live Lecture. And uh, when we talk about the nutrition as well, uh, human beings as well as the plants, everybody knew the nutrition. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, how uh, plants get nutrition although you have already mentioned in the previous lecture but uh, as we are starting once again so over to you sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, and in my last lecture actually I spoke about a different kind of elements which uh, plants acquire from nature and then convert into organic molecule for getting uh, their own growth support and uh, I could not complete that particular topic so I hope I uh, will be able to complete the general introduction today and I will speak about a few nutrition specifically again in the subsequent classes. So, uh, that is what I have given my uh, say part 2 you can talk about mineral nutrition and uh, also I will uh, tell you briefly uh, about what I have spoken before and uh, also it may be quite known to many of the biology students uh, that plants or every living being uh, relies on nutrients. But the difference between plant and other uh, that plant can take all element uh, like inorganic molecules and then eventually can convert them into organic molecule. So, this is what actually plant you can think about the factory uh, of entire universe where the life support is made by plant and by acquiring from nature like soil, air and water <coughs> these nutrients convert into organic molecule and eventually every body starting from microbes to higher animals, yeast all rely on those plant made food. So, this is very very important to learn how really plant acquire those uh, nutrients and how they convert them into organic molecules. So, uh, this is a uh, part 2 coming lecture and the previous lecture I gave it on 16th of April, the video link is available and thus if somebody missed it actually still you can go through and uh, see about the basic things. And in that class I have discussed that uh, like what is the most abundant element is there in the earth, what is the most abundant element present in plant, what is the least abundant element present in the plant and say how really plants acquire those uh, and, uh, nutrients and what you call as a mineral nutrient, what is not a nutrient and what you call as assimilation. Okay. So, today and uh, I will discuss about uh, mostly what happens when there is not enough or in other way deficiency symptoms. So, but before going to the deficiency symptoms to I will just briefly uh, retirate and also tell you uh, so that you can have the link in case you have missed the uh, previous class. Now, uh, if you look into the slides over here, uh, this is from a book on plant physiology uh, published as a 5th edition 2010 uh, written by Thais and Ziegler. And in this table, the left column tells you different kind of elements which are present in plant like hydrogen, carbon, oxygen and then nitrogen, potassium, calcium and magnesium, phosphorus, sulphur, silicon, chlorine, iron, boron, manganese, sodium, zinc, copper, nickel and molybdenum. And in the right, this middle column is the amount, relative amount present in the uh, plant. But very interestingly, you can see the rightmost column. This rightmost column are these elements are actually arranged 
according to the abundance present in a plant. Like if you say the lowest one is molybdenum. This molybdenum, if there is one molecule of molybdenum, on average there are two molecules of nickel and 100 molecules of copper. So, you can easily say that every one molecule of molybdenum plant needs, it needs say 100 molecule of copper. Now, if you go up in the table, you will find that every molecule of molybdenum is equivalent to 30,000 molecules of silicon and sulfur. And you go again up, you can see it is almost 1 million of nitrogen and 30 million of oxygen, 40 million of carbon and 60 million of hydrogen. So, naturally these are the all 19 elements which are come, which are there in the plant's body, but they are not in the same proportion or same ratio and their ratio is greatly different from one to another. However, you can also see that up to say chlorine onwards, the molecules which are really required very less amount, like say 3000 molecules to one molecule here. Now, above chlorine, you can find that it is more than tenfold, say like silicon sulfur, uh, uh, silicon sulfur, potassium, magnesium, calcium, potassium and nitrogen. So, these molecules are called macronutrients and the ones which are required much less amount, present much less in the soil and uh, in the plant are called micronutrient. <coughs> so, this is another chart which also same thing which I have uh, been telling you here. You can see the top 3 is hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. Quite interestingly, these 3 contributes to 96 percent of the plant body weight. You see here carbon contributes to 45 percent, oxygen contributes to 45 percent. So, carbon and oxygen together 90 percent and 6 percent hydrogen. So, 96 percent of the plant's body weight comes from air and water. Hydrogen is mostly obtained from water and carbon and oxygen come from air. So, air and water contributes 96 percent of the plant's weight and rest 4 percent plant acquires only from soil. And these are the major ones which are there nitrogen, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, phosphorus and silicon and these are the micronutrients. Now, you see this also I told you that micronutrients or bead macronutrients they are required much less amount compared to the rest of the other elements which are present in the plant. However, they are very essential. Like say if you can have 1 million of nitrogen compared to 1 molybdenum. However, if molybdenum is not there, then nitrogen metabolism is not possible because nitrogen metabolism absolutely dependent on presence of molybdenum. But molybdenum actually recycles in the plant and so uh, amount lit is used very little and it is not present in the building blocks. So, nit molybdenum job molybdenum is not required each in every uh, cell which or in the cell wall component, it is required by the some enzymes which are required for certain specific purposes. However, they are very crucial, very very important. So, naturally if you do not have, you will have the deficiency symptom. And also I told you about four groups of nutrients in the previous class, like the group 1 is a part of carbon compound like nitrogen and sulfur. This nitrogen and sulfur undergo redu reduction assimilation and they get incorporated in the building blocks and then phosphorus gets incorporated in the building block, but without reduction so is the silicon and uh, boron. Now, if you talk about the group 3 nutrient like calcium, potassium, magnesium, chlorine and they actually take part the ionic interactions in the cell and they do not integrate into the membrane component or structural component and you have group 4 nutrients like iron, zinc, copper, nickel and molybdenum. So, uh, they are involved in redox reactions. So, you have uh, carbon compound, you have 
energy storage, then ionic structures and nutrients for uh, redox reactions. So, these are the major four types of nutrients which you have in the plants. Now, also I told you how really people have found what a plant need for their basic support. So, this reacts, these studies are mostly based on isolated system. So, plants are taken out from nature from the soil, soil is removed and then they are grown on a media where you can control the amount of nutrient. So, nutrient they are grown on the liquid medium where amount of the nutrient is controlled and by adding some specific salts one can understand what is the minimum requirement for a plant. And so, based on this one uh, very early in 19th century William Knopf came out a formula for minimum support of the plant. And what he added is just 5 salts like potassium nitrate, calcium nitrate, potassium phosphate, magnesium sulphate and iron salt. So, today we know it needs almost 19 salts, but at that time he did not add anything and only those 5 salts were sufficient for sustenance of the plant. But later on it was realized that in 19th century the chemicals which are made were bit impured and the impurities present on the salt provided the other uh, required uh, elements. This formula was much more uh, critically examined with much better quality of chemicals and uh, Hogland Dennis in 1938 came out the composition which is still used by the uh, scientists or even the breeders throughout which is called as Hogland solution. This Hogland solution actually compose of large uh, almost all the nutrients that are required and sufficient for plants growth. So, now what we will discuss today uh, from the topic which I would like to discuss in today's class that what happens if the plants do not get sufficient amount of the nutrient. So, quite naturally the answer will be the deficiency symptom. So, if the plants do not get enough then they are going to fall sick. Now, can we understand how a, how a plant is falling sick or what deficiency is leading to the sickness and it is a very difficult. Like uh, for example, when a plant is grown in the soil there are uh, n number of uh, elements which are present and out of which only few are required by the plant and quite often the deficiency symptom by many such elements leads to quite similar kind of symptoms, but they may differ from plant to plant. Like uh, many of many times the deficiency symptoms leads to illness. Illness is a common sickness symptom in case of plants like they do if they are not happy they are not green they are they turn yellow they turn yellow when there is some kind certain types of pathogen in a, uh, infection like disease and there is a stress like lack of water or too much of salt that can cause a stress that can give yellow color and even many times lack of a certain element can also give yellowness so there are many times it is very difficult to understand that uh, a plant is uh, getting a deficiency. However, uh, if, a, if somebody wants to look carefully by looking at the growth conditions, by looking at there is no uh, pathogen invasion on the field, there is no water deficiency, salt uh, condition is quite ok, it is not that actually bad soil however plant is have turning yellow, then one can look a specific symptom to understand that what a deficiency it may be. And again it can be confusing because many times many different elements give the same symptom. Like one classical example is iron, nitrogen and molybdenum. A few minutes back I told you molybdenum is very important for nitrogen metabolism, so is iron. Now, molybdenum is least required, iron is a micronutrient, but nitrogen is a macronutrient. Nitrogen is required very high amount 
and when nitrogen is not there, nitrogen plants turn yellow. The probable reason is that nitrogen is a part of a chlorophyll molecule and chlorophyll pigments give green, green color. So, lack of nitrogen will lead to reduced chlorophyll biosynthesis and turning of the yellow. Now, uh, plant for nitrogen metabolism, plant need both iron and molybdenum. So, when iron is not there or molybdenum is not there, plant can show symptoms which may look like uh, they are suffering from nitrogen in spite of the fact that it is actually not symptom of nitrogen. So, uh, many times it is confusing, but uh, there are ways how people understand uh, that uh, this deficiency symptom is one to another and we will try to learn little bit uh, to get into that like how looking at a plant one can probably understand that this is what is going wrong. And this is also I will tell you that is very specific to a crop and so one uh, or somebody one the person who is dealing with the subject for years after years may be a farmer or a scientist in an agricultural research station who has vast experience, they can understand by looking at the plant that what kind of deficiency symptom uh, is showing up, what kind of deficiency the symptom is showing up. So, I will uh, now show you some uh, plants relationship and how the uh, plants would behave. Now, I told you about macro and micronutrient. Now, if you look at the plant's growth, uh, requirement of the plant is not uniform throughout. Plants need more nutrient at the growing end. So, the tips of the plant like say this is the growing end, the growing end would need much more amount, this is the growing end will need much more amount of the nutrient than the ones which are already grown. So, what happens actually this is already uh, uh, I mean many of you may be aware of something called source sink relationship. The older leaves over here the older leaves have the nutrients which probably they not need not need much. So, they will transfer this nutrient through the stem and it can go to the rest of the leaf. So, for nutrient this leaf becomes source and this becomes sink. So, the nutrient is get deposited here. Now, the source sink relationship is applicable for, uh, for plants growth for many resources like example uh, in case of senescence when uh, the older leaves get matured and about to die before death they transfer their all nutrients back to the plant and to the needing area so that plant do not lose nutrient. So, this is what is your sourcing relationship. Now, if you look into a plant's nutrients, all the nutrients are not equally mobile. I am talking mobile means the nutrient which can mobilize from one end say source end to the sink end. The nutrients which are mobile like example here nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, chlorine, sodium, zinc and molybdenum. They are quite mobile in nature. Like so now, if a plant is needing nitrogen at the tip where nitrogen is less, it can always acquire from the older leaves. So, the nitrogen deficiency is actually felt by the older leaves and younger leaves will eventually feel, but much later. So, older leaves will face the problem first. Now, if they are immobile or actually should be said as less mobile like calcium, sulphur, iron, boron and copper. So, these molecules are comparatively less mobile. So, like if a like for example, again nitrogen, nitrogen metabolism requires molybdenum and iron. Now, molybdenum also is mobile, it can go, but iron is not. So, naturally plant will need continuous supply of iron to have the nitrogen deficiency met because it cannot get from the old older leaves. So, this deficiency symptoms is also associated with how mobile an element is. So, the immobile elements like calcium, sulphur, boron, copper and iron 
will show the symptom first in the lower leaves. Whereas, uh, first in the upper leaf because upper leaf needs more. However, mobile symptoms they will show in the lower leaves first. I will I'll show you some of the deficiency symptoms and it will be cleared by looking at that. Look at here, this is a plant in the right side, this is a citrus plant. Uh, the citrus plant is grown under nitrogen deficiency condition. Now, if you look here in this leaf in this plant, you can see some leaves are turning yellow. And while some, some leaves are turning yellow, still certain other leaves over here, they are still green. That means, you can see the older leaves which are down first show the symptom. That is because nitrogen is highly mobile. So, what happens the upper end need more nitrogen, but the nitrogen is mobilized from the lower end, lower end of the leaves. So, the elder leaves, now if you look here, this is the youngest leaf to the eldest leaf. The eldest leaves is showing much more symptom than the younger leaves and that is because the nitrogen is highly mobile. Now, this nitrogen deficiency symptom yellowness also seen in many other plants. This is in tomato grown in um, reduced nitrogen. You can see this uh, leaves are turning uh, yellow and this is another uh, is deficiency on sunflower. This is a uh, tub grown artificial uh, soil grown soil uh, case where nitrogen was depleted and in nitrogen depletion again you can see this whole plant shows a symptom, but symptom shows early in the elder leaves. So, elder leaves have much uh, stronger symptom than the younger leaves. Now, look at the iron deficiency. This iron deficiency now it in contrast to nitrogen deficiency, but similar in the way that both turns yellow because nit iron is also component of nitrogen metabolism. So, when nitrogen is not there, leaves will turn yellow and it will show similar like nitrogen symptom. However, there are some specific symptom as well. Like here you can see the symptom is much more in the venal area. So, these are vein area and this is called intervenal chlorosis. If you look closely in these leaves, what you will find the chlorosis or what I am telling as a turning of the leaves is much more between the veins. So, it is intervenal chlorosis is there. Now, again you look at the citrus plant that is grown in the reduced iron condition. So, this if you see now in the citrus plant you will find it is exactly reverse of what you had seen earlier in case of nitrogen deficiency. This is also an experimental plot where, sit, where iron was withdrawn and nitrogen is in abundance. Now, if you look here what you can see in this case the symptoms first appear in the upper leaves and the lower leaves actually do not show the symptom. The reason is that iron is less mobile compared to the nitrogen. So, this is the uh, same thing over here you can see this is the this is the reverse thing you can see the more yellow over here and the elder leaves over here they are much more green. They are green because they have iron, but they, their requirement is less. The upper end, the growing end, they need more iron, so they do not get enough, so they show the symptom first. Similarly, you can see this is uh, more clearer about an iron deficiency in Angelonia, that is a uh, ornamental plant. And again, if you see when it is grown under reduced iron, the left plant is the control plant, entire plant is green and they have been grown in a healthy soil. And here in this soil, nitrogen was depleted. Now, you see the symptoms, uh, sorry iron was depleted. In the iron depleted, look at the upper leaves, upper leaves are much more a pale color than the lower leaves. And this is again I am telling you because iron is less mobile. So, it cannot travel from the source to sink and reduced iron. So, the symptom in upper leaves first. Uh, another one is beautiful colored uh, ornamental plant uh, 
uh, impatience. And again, you can see the complete iron deficiency shows uh, kind of albino color, which may look attractive, but the plant is definitely not healthy, it is sick and the upper ones have a more symptom than the lower one. So, there are many examples, here is another one, iron deficiency in zinnia, exactly again you can see the control plants in the left is very healthy, but in the right side you see the lower plants, lower ones are pretty green, but not the upper ones upper ones is turning pale yellow. So, it again uh, tells you in many plants like as I have shown you in case of uh, citrus, in case of impatience, angelona and in case of zinnia everywhere iron deficiency will show the yellowness on the uh, top line. Now, say as I told you a few minutes earlier that uh, many plants actually show uh, yellowness is a common symptom of uh, non-healthiness status, but if you eliminate the uh, there is no pathogen uh, infection, there is no other stress and if you go and look at the field where you may uh, see that yellowness of the leaves, then you may look whether yellowness is in the upper leaves or in the lower leaves. If it is in the upper leaves, then most likely it going to be like iron, but in lower leaves it can be due to nitrogen most likely or in a, uh, some small cases it can be also due to molybdenum. Molybdenum is also mobile like nitrogen. So, similar phenotype nitrogen and molybdenum will give, but uh, iron will have a different phenotype. But again molybdenum is required very little and plants do not usually suffer from the deficiency. Okay. Now, again if you look into some other deficiency symptoms like I am showing here for uh, sulphur deficiency, this sulphur deficiency uh, you can see it may be confusing again with what I showed you iron, but look at the area which is different. Iron deficiency showed in the inner center area, but the sulphur deficiency is in the mostly in the outer area. So, again uh, there are differences in uh, different terms over here. This is sulphur deficiency in sunflower, overall plant is small, there is a uh, some kind of sickness uh, generated over here. Look at the sulphur deficiency in petunia, sulphur is another molecule which is less mobile. So, you can see the upper ones is much more uh, pale or so, but it is not turning yellow like uh, what you have seen in case of iron deficiency. Phosphorus deficiency, phosphorus is required mostly by the growing ends again. Phosphorus many of you know it is present in the DNA uh, between the uh, bases. So, phosphorus is required in each and every dividing cells. However, story of phosphorus is quite interesting and also I will try to cover today or some other class. The phosphate is a negatively charged uh, nutrient. Due to its negative charge, they are they usually get repelled by soil particles. Soil particles are positively uh, soil particles are negatively charged. They can hold the positive charge elements, but they repel phosphate, uh, uh, repel like phosphate chlorate, nitrate. They can repel, and phosphate also get repelled by the uh, soil particle. And also, when it combines with calcium or aluminium, they precipitate and that is not available by the plant. So, plants often suffer from the phosphate deficiency and that is why even the phosphate uh, and, and uh, fertilizer actually all the fertilizers are added with phosphorus. And if you look into the phosphorus, the deficiency symptom is easily understood if one compares between the root and shoot. The phosphorus deficiency, in case of phosphorus deficiency, the shoot growth reduces, but at the same time root growth increases. So, if you see here in any case what happens, uh, the root growth in the minus phosphorus conditions is much more than the phosphorus uh, present conditions. <coughs> so, we call that the growth of root at the cost of shoot. The reason being that uh, since plants have to acquire phosphorus from the soil, 
they will try to improve their root architecture and enhancement of the root uh, branching. So, more and more root branching are there, they can access more amount of the soil and thereby uh, more amount of phosphorus. So, whenever there is a phosphorus deficiency, root length increases and that usually happens at the cost of shoot growth. Potassium deficiency again uh, you can see here uh, you get some kind of burning symptoms and usually it happens by the margins. So, here you can get chlorosis mostly during margin, it is not chlorosis more like a burning symptom, potassium and zinc this two gives the burning symptom, but potassium typically have the symptoms mostly in the leaf margins. Like you can see here it is a very good one uh, in PGNP. This is a potassium deficiently uh, grown PGNP. You see here how the symptoms are shown in the leaf margins. Uh, here is potassium deficiency in begonia and so there are quite a many uh, articles are there. Maybe it is not required to know all of them, but the main purpose of me to tell you that there are certain distinct symptoms specifically on a specific crop. So, one experienced eye by looking at the symptoms can sometimes judge that what is wrong in that plant and what the supplement is required. Molybdenum efficiency again something I have been telling you will look more like a nitrogen deficiency because it is more important for the nitrogen deficiency. Manganese deficiency in tobacco looks like viral spots, here uh, a lot of dots are there, but one can easily look if the virus is there or not and if not then probably it is a, a manganese deficiency. <coughs> Zinc deficiency like potassium deficiency this also gives the burning symptom, but it is not restricted to the uh, marginal area. The potassium deficiency, zinc deficiency shows entire uh, leaf margin, entire leaf blades. Okay. Uh, this is boron deficiency on geranium and uh, boron deficiency on roots. So, again uh, you see here in contrast to phosphate deficiency where root was highly increased uh, in the absence of phosphorus, but in the absence of boron root growth is actually reduced. That means, boron is may be positively regulating root growth in compared to phosphorus, where lack of phosphorus actually improves of uh, uh, root growth. Calcium is another uh, important uh, macronutrient, calcium deficiency leads to wilting kind of symptoms in tomato and other plants. Look at the uh, argyranthium and you can see overall stunting of the plant without yelling or other uh, features. So, there are, uh, this is another copper deficiency on petunia. So, plants may look very small, but again as I am telling you this may be very difficult to know the actual reason of deficiency by looking at the symptoms only. Okay. So, I have talked about quite many different type of uh, symptoms which you can see and some of the symptoms have the distinct pattern by which one can understand what is actually gone wrong. Okay. Now, so, there are lot of, of letter, uh, there are lot of scopes of misjudging by looking at the symptoms. Then is there any way that one can understand what really is lacking or what a plant needs? There are two ways it can be done. One way is to do by the plant analysis. See, if previously, uh, uh, previous class also today morning I showed you a table by looking at the amount of element which is present in the plant starting from molybdenum to hydrogen or one molecule versus 60 million of molecule. Now, if we know for a particular plant what should be the elemental pattern and one can analyze by an atom analyzer to see what is the composition of the suffered plant has it compared to the healthy plant. And that may be an indication that this may be really plant is lacking from. This is more like of 
you can say the health check of what people can do it to know how what is the kidney liver function uh, sodium cal potassium calcium and all however uh, this in uh, atom analysis of the plant requires much bigger setup it is not available in every corner of the country and much more sophisticated instrument but much easier way and routinely done by analyzing the soil because there are uh, setup is there in large number of agricultural research stations where farmer can take the soil and they can tell by analyzing that what is the composition of soil and what is the pH of the soil, what is the CEC or cation exchange capacity and also they would suggest that what should be added to the soil so that plant grows uh, better. So, this is the much more feasible method which is actually soil testing. There are soil testing laboratories which analyze the soil and tell you actually what the plant need. Now, if you look here actually I am showing uh, now one uh, analysis of the laboratory of soil. So, you can again look into the different parameters which is over there and I have highlighted uh, so, now look at the graph below which must be more clear. You see this there are a lot of parameters like pH, phosphorus, this graph tells you potassium, then magnesium, then calcium, sulphur and boron, copper, iron, manganese and zinc. And in the y axis you have like low, then medium, good, high and very high. Now, you look here pH, pH is high that means it is slightly acidic soil. This is not good, it is little less than good because pH is high, sorry pH is high that means it is light alkaline soil, it is uh, slightly alkaline soils and uh, look at the phosphorus it is very high there is no problem in the phosphorus. But it is reduced or medium content is potassium is there, but it is really suffering from copper you look here this is the one. So, if you have a plant which is not growing healthy if you analyze the soil you can find certain molecules like here as example copper, copper is the much below of a medium level much much lower than what it should be good. So, definitely the uh, scientist would advise the farmer to apply copper and maybe other micronutrients like uh, manganese to a certain extent, but definitely potassium should be added to the, so that everything comes to the good level. So, this is the good level. Besides this level of uh, this beside this overall level the report also has quite a many things which may not be applicable directly to the farmer, but to the scientist who can uh, decide what is going wrong in a plant in a soil. Like I have highlighted here one factor which is written here as CEC. The CEC stands for cation exchange capacity. So, that is a very important factor of a soil and I will try to elaborate you what actually uh, this soil uh, CEC means about it. Now, soil pH as I am telling you, so pH uh, can be ranged from 0 to 14, but in the soil uh, anywhere if you have a 5.5 to 6.5 you tell that it is kind of a good soil. So, because most of the nutrients are soluble between 5.5 to 6.5. The any pH which is below 5.5 is a acidic soil and this acidic soil is not good for the plant growth and again any pH of the soil more than 6.5 is not very good for the plants. So, uh, there is a range between 5.5 to 6.5 is good. Now, why they are good probably may be understood by looking at this chart. This chart actually tells you the solubility of different elements from as a range of pH. The lower one which you cannot see is the pH. So, here the leftmost column over here is pH 4 
and the rightmost column over here is pH 9. So, the solubility is now graded over pH 4 to pH 9. Now, you look here, this is nitrogen. This nitrogen maximum solubility is somewhere around 6.5 to 7. However, solubility is there say at least from 5 to 9. Phosphorus is a critical one. Phosphorus has a very low range of solubility. So, it is actually good say maybe 4.5 to this point which is around 6.5. So, 4.5 to 6.5 is the range where phosphorus is soluble. Potassium again 4.5 to maybe 8. Sulphur is insoluble at the low pH, but soluble at throughout the higher pH more than 5.5. Similarly, calcium is also like sulphur less soluble in acidic soil, but as soon as pH raises above 5.5, it is largely soluble. Look at magnesium, magnesium again has a dual uh, uh, like it is insoluble both in acidic soil as well as in alkaline soil. So, is iron and so is manganese. In manganese actually it is mostly soluble in acidic range, but soon as the pH becomes more than 6.5, it turns insoluble. Boron likes phosphorus again, it has a very a narrow range of solubility. So, pH 5.5 to 6.5 is the range, beyond that solubility greatly reduces. Copper little over bigger range, zinc you can again see zinc is soluble in acidic soil, but as soon as pH goes more than 7, 7 or 7.5, it starts declining a lot and molybdenum is mostly soluble in alkaline soil. So, if you look into these ones only, you can easily say a pH between 5.5 and 6.5, this is the block where most of the elements remain soluble. And unless an element is soluble, plant cannot take it. So, that is why pH of a soil is very, very important factor for determining how a plant would grow on them. And that is why in the soil testing laboratory will tell you what is the pH of the soil. And there are correction measures and even the scientists can tell you how to correct a pH which is not optimum and there can be different ways to do it. So, now uh, let us discuss in this plant physiology course that whether it is good to be soluble or bad to be soluble. Now, question is that if an element is insoluble, plant cannot get it. So, definitely solubility is good, but as soon as soluble, it is not good in the sense that it can wash off. Like for example, uh, if you provide uh, nitrate fertilizer, potassium nitrate for example, you give a nitrate fertilizer, this nitrate is negatively charged. This negatively charged iron will be repelled by the soil particle, soil is not going to retain it. Now, what will happen? So, whenever there is an extra water, it comes either from the irrigation or from the rain, they are going to wash up and eventually go to the drain. So, solubility is good, but too much of solubility is not good. There should be solubility at a controlled rate. In the sense like as you see many cases, they are like in salt ionized in the water. So, you get uh, dissociated form, ionic form and combined which is salt form. So, the ion forms are used by the plant and if it is a reduced soluble, plant can take it and a rest soil can retain in insoluble form or as a salt form. <coughs> so, these are the one which is good. Now, coming to the cation exchange capacity which I was telling you very uh, a few minutes back. and. Uh, so, if it is the structure of a soil particle, now you see what I told you that these are all negatively charged. This is a soil particle and is negatively charged. Because it is negatively charged, it is going to retain all the positive charge element. If you now look at the positive charge element like calcium, potassium, magnesium, sodium, boron, manganese, all the metals are positively charged ions. This metallic ions, they are positively charged and they are retained by the calcium, uh, retained by the soil particle. Now, if a plant has to obtain this positive ion, they must be released from the soil. 
otherwise if they are tightly ionically bound with the soil then plant cannot absorb it. So, one of the reason actually like many of the uh, students know the displacement reactions. In metal displacement series potassium is highly active metal and potassium can displace large amount to large number of molecules in an ionic interaction. So, potassium is added in large amount in a fertilizer and this potassium can exchange the other uh, pot cations like uh, this is what is called the cation exchange capacity. So, instead of providing n number of metal ions the farmers throw fertilizer apply potassium and this potassium can replace say calcium for example, magnesium and other um, positively charged ions. So, that these are available by the plants to absorb it. So, how much how, how, how much is rich soil is in terms of cations are usually reflected by its cation exchange capacity. If only they have sufficient uh, metallic ions to exchange then only the plants would grow he he healthy happily otherwise definitely supplement of this metal nutrients are also required. Now, as I told you about the anions like chloride, hydrogen phosphate, nitrate they are the major anions that plant absorbs. And as I told you earlier since these particles are negatively charged they are repelled by the soil and they get collected by the drain water. So, it is good for the plant because plant can absorb but the bad for the farmers because being soluble they get leached and farmers have to pay a spray or apply again and again on the soil. So, this is what happens for the chloride, phosphate and nitrate. Now, you see till chloride is not applied on the soil because soil has abundant chloride and chloride is a micronutrient. So, nobody, no, none of the farmer applied chloride, but farmers apply a lot about lot of the phosphate and nitrate. Phosphate readily reacts with the aluminum and iron get insolubilized and that really does not cause much of toxicity, but that is lost to the farmers uh, pocket. However, problem actually much more comes in the nitrate because nitrate is negatively charged ap required by the plant a lot, farmers apply a lot and that nitrates get washed off during the um, rain or the drainage water. So, uh, that is what eventually uh, happens when there is a negatively charged uh, element. So, there are too much of negatively charged elements. Now, actually when so now the question comes when a, fart, when a farmer should apply fertilizer and when they should not. So, naturally that also can be justified or uh, validated by looking at the soil testing report. If a particular uh, soil is deficient with some nutrients like ex example which is shown over here like this is the curve here is showing this is the deficient zone. In the deficient zone if fertilizer is added then crops will grow healthy. This is the adequate zone. In the adequate zones if fertilizer is added then it is not going to increase anymore of the yield. However, if it is excessive it is already there high amount and you add more fertilizer then the growth is going to get reduced. So, how much or amount of how much and when the fertilizer to be added is very very important of the crop. And, uh, so, this is also similar uh, thing over shown over here like maximum yield increment is obtained only when plant is suffering from a nutrient. However, at the end if you provide it is going to cost the growth of the plant. Now, coming to uh, like the question how really plants acquire those nutrients and it is uh, quite uh, well known to most of the EO biology students uh, that plant acquire even uh, acquire most of the nutrients elements from soil through root system. However, it acquires gaseous component like carbon dioxide which contribute to 90 percent of the growth is from the air. This is also quite interesting and you can see here the root actually grow between the soil particles. So, these are the soil particles root grow over here and eventually there are transporters in the root these transporters can transport nutrient from the soil to the plant and then 
plant have the phloem xylem xylem which can carry the water containing nutrient inside the plant so there are many different roots structure may be different but overall there are roots which are there in the plant and can help to acquire nutrient now many times as i told you also if there are system there are deficiency sometimes the root architecture uh, alters but eventually root become the primary source of getting nutrients and because they are obtained or mined from the soil they are called mineral nutrient this is the structure of a root if you look here normally as might have see, you have seen in many of the textbooks you, this is the root cap just below the root cap you have a very soft zone which you call as a root apical meristem that do not absorb nutrients but helps to root grow more this is the elongation zone again almost uh, inactive in absorption very little absorption but absorption starts from hair range so now the root hairs are developed so the soil contact increases and this part actually absorbs a uh, soil absorbs water uh, uh, water and a uh, nutrient now many of you may not be knowing that actually if you uproot a plant from the soil most of the time it look different this is not typically what you get in a textbook picture and this may look much more like this if you want to test you just go out take any plant you see in front of uh, your house just uproot it and wipe your hand with the root end you will see some brown color things will come in your fingers if you uh, rub with your finger and that growth is not from the plant but mostly by the fungus which grow by the side of the root so actual picture of the root if you take a plant out of the soil will more look like this see this is the inner part which you have seen earlier but you can see there are large number of fungus they grow outside and they are called mycorrhiza this mycorrhiza are in symbiotic association with plant and they help for the acquiring nutrients by the plant what happen actually plant can do it plant can increase their root branching but they are not as efficient in elongating as like a fungus can do it so plants and this fungi mycorrhiza grow in uh, together like a symbiotic relationship so this uh, mycorrhiza will grow rapidly at the cost of the nutrient from the plant so plant will provide the basic nutritional support to the mycorrhiza in return mycorrhiza will acquire uh, nutrients from the soil say this is very very important and experimentally has been shown specially for phosphate uptake uh especially you can see uh, the plants which are not capable of making mycorrhiza association they suffer more of a phosphate deficiency than the plants which are capable of making this mycorrhiza association and this mycorrhiza are essentially like an exaggerated uh, branch formation so there are heavy branching and that branch actually can eventually go between the soils and between the uh, root systems so if you can look here you will find uh, that uh, there is a structures which are uh, growing between the soils and growing it so i am also almost to the end of my talk and i will give you a summary what i told you in today's class and also the previous class and the summary actually if you have a few points to mention here the first point what i told you that plants body is composed of 19 atoms with a different quantity and the quantity can range from 60 million to 1 like 60 million of uh, hydrogen to one molecule of molybdenum so that much of difference and the plants grow mostly by taking air if you just see one plant which may be 500 metric ton weighs very large tree 
90 percent the weight they have got only from the air soil contributes very little only 4 percent of its growth carbon and oxygen are the two most abundant two most weight contributing element that contributes 90 percent of the weight almost 6 percent weight comes from the water and rest 4 percent water comes weight comes from the soil only plants can acquire all of its nutrient from the elemental form all from the inorganic form and they can eventually convert them to organic form. So, this is called assimilation and they do not need any synthetic molecule because they can synthesize everything. So, that is the beauty of the plant and there are two elements nitrogen and sulfur. This nitrogen and sulfur can undergo reduction assimilation like carbon and they are integrated into the structural component other molecules are not as much as structural component other than certain amount of silicon and boron. Phosphorus is boron, silicon are mostly important for energy uh, currency, energy conversion and other elements like iron, molybdenum, zinc, copper they are more required for redox reaction. Okay. So, uh, then also what I told you that a deficiency if there is not sufficient plant is growing to show deficiency and that deficiency may be specific to a particular nutrient or may be different in different ratios and root as the primary source of absorbing mineral and there are symbiotic association with root and fungi like mycorrhiza that can enhance the I mean uh, enhance the process by which plants acquire nutrition from the soil and I hope uh, this uh, lecture will be useful for your study and thank you so much for listening it. With this note, thank you sir, thank you so very much uh, for giving once again a very productive session. Dear friends, if you have uh, any queries or if you want to give your feedback regarding this particular lecture, you can mail us at info.cc at the rate nick.in and if you want to access this particular lecture, you can access it with the help of YouTube as we daily upload lectures for you so that it becomes easier for you to go through these lectures uh, ample of time. And with this note, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ashish Nandi once again uh, for his delightful presence and he would be coming again and we would be discussing more and more. Thank you sir. Thank You're you welcome. so very much.